Hi, myself Dr. Vivek Vardhan Virapanini. Join us for the exciting chat with the expert session with Dr. Melvin Tay. Dr. Melvin Tay is a consultant and director of interventional pulmonology at the Department of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, Singapore General, General Hospital, Singh Health, Duke NUS Lung Center. Dr. Melvin Tay, please carry on with the presentation. Thank you. What are all the EBUS? Uh, characteristics of the node which can which you feel can uh, differentiate the tuberculosis from sarcoidosis so uh, like i have uh, mentioned earlier um, i think uh, the features on ultrasound cannot be taken you know um, just uh, as the gospel truth so but uh, typically i think uh, the sarcoid granulomas uh, they are probably more uh, homogeneous in appearance and uh, you know probably uh, the lining of the lymph node may be a bit more uh, well circumscribed. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, in TB, uh, they're probably because of the necrosis, areas of necrosis, uh, the ultrasound appearance may be uh, more heterogeneous. Yeah, but uh, then again, uh, I, like I've mentioned earlier in my, in my slides, uh, there is a, uh, an entity, right? So uh, uh, necrotizing uh, sarcoid granulomas, uh, which can also present with necrosis, and you know there have been the case uh, studies of uh, people, you know, sort of like uh, misdiagnosing it as uh, TB. And uh, generally, the EBUS characteristics of the nodes, like a heterogeneous echogenicity or coagulation necrosis sign, are attributed to malignancy. But in a TB endemic region, do you feel it is relevant in distinguishing a benign lymph node from a malignant lymph node? Yeah, so I think the utility will be much less. Okay, so um, like uh, I've mentioned earlier um, as well, a, I think the diagnosis of, um, of malignant nodes, right, uh, in the staging of uh, lung cancer, I think it's well studied, right? Uh, but uh, that is only if the pretest probability of malignancy is uh, very, very high and you do not have, you know, other confounding, um, for example, uh, diseases like uh, TB lymphadenitis or even sarcoidosis. So, uh, and that's why it's important uh, to actually pay attention and to be very, very um, acutely sensitive uh, to the uh, local uh, sort of uh, epidemiology uh, of, uh, as well as the etiologies of uh, this condition um, that we encounter in our clinical practice. And, and, and that, that is the reason why like uh, just now, I you know listed studies from you know China, Japan, Taiwan, UK, uh, Australia, and can see that you know there is very varied, you know even when uh, approaching, um, uh, you know mediastinal lymphadenopathy uh, as well as the benign causes, the breakdown. Yeah. So I don't think it's going to be so useful at the end of the day, uh, especially. Uh, um, I've also made this uh, highlighted this point earlier um, in the diagnosis uh, of benign metastinal diseases uh, in using EBUS TBNA. Um, the whole clinical picture must uh, must be taken into account. So the clinical, uh, radiological, and in the case of TB, you probably you'll be better to have um, some microbiology kind of uh, a uh, confirmation. But uh, you know they're only about close to about less than half of these patients will have some microbiological uh, uh, sort of a uh, deal uh, on TBAS, EB, uh, TB, uh, EBAS TBNA, whether it's uh, AIV smear or cultures. And uh, how common in, is in your practice you see there is a coexistence of a TB with a malignancy? You get a gene expert positive later, the lymph node uh, turns out to be malignant as well. And how would you yeah. approach these cases? So uh, it's a uh, very... That's also a very good question. Uh, so we have uh, been having, uh, we have seen uh, quite um, a variety, I mean, a few cases uh, of coexisting, uh, coexisting TB with malignancy. So um, the, and that is why I think uh, for, for us, uh, you know, going back to uh, basic uh, clinical, um, for example, taking good history, you know, uh, physical exam and taking a look at the whole, um, uh, reviewing the whole um, sort of imaging and all those will really help. So um, I've got cases uh, whereby uh, not just small cell, non-small cell lung CA coexisting with uh, TB, but you know, there are also some extra thoracic uh, tumors that I've seen, like for example, renal cell carcinoma uh, with TB. 
you know, and uh, the lymphoma with TB, right? So um, it's, uh, I would say it's a, you know, there is no one size fits all uh, answer to that, right? But I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, we have to assess, uh, for example, the tempo of the, the illness itself, you're uh, always entertaining the, the, the possibility that, you know, there might be uh, two, there might be an alternative diagnosis or an additional diagnosis, right? And then uh, which will hinge very um, heavily on the, the clinical presentation, and the history, the progress of the imaging, right? Yeah, so uh, at the end of the day, I think, uh, you know, it, it is a very difficult question to give you a, a very targeted answer, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's a case-by-case -case basis, but it's always important uh, to just, uh, you know, keep in mind that uh, things can happen together. I mean, in our uh, population that uh, we don't have so uh, many occupational lung diseases, right? But uh, if you have like silicosis and all, uh, they are at high risk of getting, for example, uh, TB as well as uh, lung cancer, right? So I think in those cases are a bit more straightforward, but uh, in our local population, it's not like that. But, um, but, but yes, uh, you're right. Uh, we have seen uh, quite a few cases uh, whereby it coexists, and sometimes it may be difficult to tell one from the other. Uh, but I think um, one important point is that, uh, you know, in TB, uh, if the lesions, uh, obviously, even if you have, for example, some microbiology and you've given, uh, you know, a trial treatment, you know, and by two months, you know, they are still. I mean, maybe the cultures are really the negative, you know, blah, 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 but they're still not putting on weight. There's a radiographical uh, worsening. Uh, and yeah, you may, you, you, you must always suspect that, you know, you may not be just TB alone. And in those kind of cases, uh, you know, it might be a delayed diagnosis, but, uh, you know, that is, the, that is a very real life uh, situation that we often encounter, right? Especially in TB endemic countries. I'm sure, uh, Dr. Viz, you, you, you have the same experience, right? You know, so it's like, you know, if they don't get you for isolated TB, you said treated for TB, it's drug sensitive and they don't get better then. Yeah, I, I mean, of course we have to reevaluate further. Sir, and uh, how uh, common do you see the presence of a non-tubercular mycobacterium as a cause of a mediastinal lymphadenopathy? Honestly, um, it's not common. Yeah, I actually do not uh, typically see uh, non uh, tuberculosis, uh, mycobacteria presenting with uh, TB, I mean, with limb adenitis, yeah. Um, and the diagnosis is, is, is even more tricky, right? I mean, the diagnosis for, uh, you know, NTM disease is already, uh, is already complex enough, right? We have to take into consideration the symptomatology, right? Uh, worsening, uh, yeah, uh, radiographical worsening, whether it's nodules or cavities, and then uh, you must have isolated them on either EF, I mean, the EFB cultures, either on one set of BAL or two sets of sputum. Yeah, but uh, it, it is really, really uncommon. I've not, I've not really uh, actually uh, diagnosed uh, a case of uh, lymph adenitis, right? That, that causative uh, organism actually grew uh, NTM. So I, I am afraid I do not have the answer to that. But uh, yeah, in my clinical practice, no, you, yeah, majority of them, in fact, they yeah, are in infections. Majority of them are TB related. Yeah. How common is it a uh, primary drug resistant uh, mediastinal tubercular lymphadenopathy? Like in a patient, primary drug resistant uh, mediastinal lymphadenopathy. Do you so see I it? Think, uh, uh, so I think, uh, you know, uh, the, the answer is going to be the same, uh, about the same for, um, for example, pleural TB. So, you know, in pleural TB and I, I think in mediastinal TB, I think the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, prevalence of all this drug resistant uh, TB causing uh, either pleural TB or mediastinal uh, TB lymphadenitis is not high. Yeah, not high. So far, uh, at least in our clinical practice, most of them are drug sensitive. Yeah. So unlike uh, pulmonary disease, uh, of course, you know, uh, it may be higher, but even for in Singapore, the baseline uh, drug resistance, even in PTB pulmonary tuberculosis, is not high. So, but for TB lymphadenitis as well as uh, uh, TB pro effusions, right, it is even even lower. Yeah, I mean that that is uh, that is what 
comes off the top of my head. Yeah. And uh, do you generally subject these samples for uh, upfront uh, drug susceptibility testing or a molecular test like a gene expert every time? Or mm. uh, is it like on a case-to-case -case basis that you look for a presence of drug resistance in these samples? So that, 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 that therein lies the question again, right? So whether uh, how of all these diagnostic tests, you know, uh, whether how well studied they are. So, I mean, not going to give you a lecture on the diagnostic uh, tests, but, you know, there's always pretest and, uh, you know, uh, pretest probability, Bayesian theorem, right? Likelihood ratios, post test uh, probability. So, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, in using nuclei uh, amplification tests, uh, uh, tests uh, in TB lymph venenitis is obviously not very well studied. And uh, uh, just to quote uh, a study that uh, that was done in the Australia, I think there was only one case that was uh, positive. So um, I, I wouldn't routinely send it in the TB lymph venenitis. Usually it's just uh, AFB smear and cultures. And um, the other thing is uh, for culture and sensitivity, um, it, it is a routine for labs once they have isolate uh, MTC as an organism that uh, the drug sensitivity will definitely be tested. Yeah, but, uh, you know, like I, as I said, I don't think the prevalence of this disease, right? I mean, this drug resistant uh, TB lymphadenitis is high enough for us to sort of just have a, you know, bundle plus send them for uh, so many uh, tests, right? From the from word go. So, you know, are doing all this uh, rapid turnaround tests like NAAT or other, other uh, you know, diagnostic tests that uh, test specifically for drug use. So it's not cost effective and definitely uh, not practical, I mean, in my opinion. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, that's the end of the session.